Kings chapter 3, and I trust you have a copy of this um, short Bible study tonight just for a few moments. I'm glad to be serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, our, our, this, this morning, or one of our sessions today, we're getting ready, I guess the only session we had today in soul winning, uh, Brother Kevin Mooring gave it a little challenge, and he talked about the fact that, you know, Solomon uttered those words that all is vanity, vanity, all is vanity, as nothing uh, seemingly had any meaning to him under the sun, but in, when we're in God's family, God's work, our life is given a great purpose Great purpose. I mean, what would I be living for if I wasn't living for Jesus? A very, a, a, whatever it would be would fall so far short of what I, what I have attained to through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to have the opportunity to do now. What you and I have the opportunity to do is a great, great thing. And the challenge, sometimes the challenge for us is to just kind of, maybe to, to kind of grab, try to grab a hold of the reins, maybe pull up a little bit, slow down the momentum, uh, take the path, the well-worn path, or you can see the ruts very easily, and you don't, you won't get lost, and nothing's grown over. We're going, many people walk this way, and I understand there's a, a good reason for that at times, as we try to walk in some paths that have been made for us. But what I want to do is exactly what God wants me to do, and I want to attempt some great things for God. Amen. Amen. I don't know how you feel about it. Maybe, maybe, you gotta, maybe you have to encourage yourself in the Lord just a little bit about that. It'd be real easy to rest on what's been accomplished for the last 28 years in this church and kind of ride this thing out to glory, or we could just allow God to continue to build things on the foundation that's been laid and accomplish more for Christ. I say we're here. We're breathing God's air. We might as well get something done for the Lord. Amen. We might as well attempt things. By the way, we must be yielded to God. Must be in his will. We don't try to accomplish for the sake of accomplishment, for the sake of making a name for ourselves, for the sake of making ourselves feel good, like we're getting, like we are getting something done. I want to be in God's will completely, but I want to launch out and to see what God can do with my life. I'd like to him to see, I'd like to see what he could do with our church. As we'll continue to take the risk of faith. The risk of faith uh, to see more accomplished for him. And it's interesting how that works. And you think about it, even as a church like this was begun, uh, my, my dad and many of those that came along beside him and our, our family, thank God for people that are still in this place after all those years. But there was, it was new. It was, all, it was like it was the pioneering level of all of it. It was, it was new. We, we were talking today about the Ruritan building over there. And uh, ben, was, ben said he had looking at some buildings in Newport News. We're still praying about what all is going to happen over there, where they're going to land, where they're going to be as far as meeting eventually. Still praying. I'm still praying about Dozier Middle School, by the way. I'm not giving up on that. Anyway, just want to get that in there. But, but we said something about it, some community building. He said, and he said, I've heard that starting a church in a rear tent building, building might work. I don't know. I heard it might work. I said, well, I don't know if that building had much to do with it. Yeah. But thank God it was there. And uh, it was available to us and many other people, too, who made themselves known there. At least they had the rudiments of what went on there were left behind for us to, uh, to observe and not, not so much enjoy. Anyway, my point is this. There was a pioneering part where it was a little more exciting, it maybe in, in a sense that but somehow in every generation of this church, we must maintain that spiritual edge. In every generation of this church, we must find a way to maintain that spiritual edge. May there always be a group of pioneers in this group of believers. Amen. I'd like to think all of us could sign up for that. If we think it requires physical energy, maybe, maybe we will fade. I think there's a lot more to it than physical energy. Someone was asking me about a friend the other day that I know, and they said, well, what do you think he's going to do? I said, I think he wants to start another church. They said, he wants to start another church? Is he young enough to do that? I said, well, I don't know if he is or not. He looks like he's in pretty good, better shape than I am, but, uh, but he wants to start a church, I believe, and if he does, I want to help him. And I, I just think if God calls him to do it, he's going to get it done. I, I know that there's a level of physical energy required in some things, but we need this, the energy of the Spirit of God, Almighty God just to keep on going. I'm giving, I, typically I start with the Bible, but it's a little different effort. I've tried to explain that to you on Wednesday night where I share some things from our heart. Typically, we've been studying prayer. I'm going to get back to that. We had a wonderful lesson on prayer in the Sunday school hour this past Sunday. I hope you were part of it. And uh, we're getting ready to move into a study of First uh, Peter now, Strengthen Thy Brethren, for the next several weeks. But uh, prayer is important. We'll get back to that. But I cannot ignore where we're at and what we're doing. 
I cannot ignore what we're doing. I thank God for the, the, the fact that our church is helping to start another church. And uh, we talk about this. Maybe you're tired of hearing about it, but you're going to have to hang in there a little bit longer, maybe a few more years. We're going to keep talking about it because we're excited about it. And you are excited about it. We all are. I don't think anyone's uh, tired of it. Their feet may be tired from walking the streets the last few days. I told, uh, I told Ben and, uh, and Caleb this morning, we were out at Dozier Middle School, had a chance to get in and look at the place. I said, you know, I'm walking down the sidewalk. I can't say that my feet hurt, but they don't feel the same as they did uh, two days ago. They don't feel like they did on Sunday. They feel different today on Wednesday because we've walked a few miles since then. What am I trying to say? It's, there's an excitement about being on the edge of doing something. And I think here in, first, in 2 Kings chapter 3, I just want to remind us about that. Uh, we've studied this together before, but it's an interesting thought here. In 1 Kings chapter 3, in verse 14, Elisha here is dealing with these kings. And in verse 14 of 2 Kings chapter 3, if you're there, say amen, please. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. He was a little aggravated with this group of kings. Every once in a while, when people launch out and do something that other people think is crazy, people get upset with them. Now, I'm making an application. The context here is that these kings had banded together. They had formed, formed some coalition. They would launched out together, marching their armies. And they, they got to going to a, toward a place, and they figured they got to a stopping place and realized they had no water for their armies. They didn't plan ahead very well. They just knew they wanted to get together and go. I'm not saying that's always wise. The Bible says no way to count the costs. But you know what? Some people are going to sit around counting so long they never get anything done. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying we ought not count the cost. We ought not plan wisely. But I want to be unleashed for God. Elisha was a little upset. These kings had gotten themselves in a pickle, so to speak. Got themselves in a dry place where there was no water. But thank goodness when they got there, they realized they needed help beyond themselves. They acknowledged they had a need. Sometimes we're so foolish to think we, we don't have a need, uh, but they acknowledged the need. Thank goodness they, they, even I don't have time to read it, but they bowed and asked God for some help. They looked to God for some help. Jehoshaphat helped them with that. They agreed with God about what was going on in their situation there, and they, uh, God allowed them to attain a victory. In this chapter, we see that, but it started because they launched out in a direction and they got themselves in a corner where there was no water and all they could do was ask God for help and God sent God's man. That's what's happening here. Verse 15, now he says here, now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. This is Elisha. He was upset with these fellows. He wasn't happy with them and he needed someone to come calm him down <laughs> just a little bit. Someone to play an instrument. We could go more into that, but in essence, we see a picture of worship here. Sometimes we get so distracted and so defeated by the world, before we can move ahead for God and accomplish anything for God, we need to get back into the place of worship. Now, just because he called in the musician doesn't mean, just because you have music doesn't mean you have worship. There's a whole other discussion about that. We've, discussed, we've studied worship in the melting pot in Sunday school this past several weeks, and I'm very glad of it. Very glad of it. I want us to understand whether we're 100 years old in this church or as, as young as you can be with any comprehension about the fact that we're trying to worship God according to the dictates of the Bible, not according to what I like or what you like or what the world might like or what another Christian might like. We want to do what God likes. We want to do what God likes. And by God's grace, as long as I'm the pastor, as far as I can tell what God likes, that's what we are going to do. We're not going to change our style of worship to get more people in this building. When we get a bigger building, we may feel pressure. What can we do to fill it up? We are not going to change the style of worship. Now, I don't want to appear rude about it, but I just think it needs to be said. We will change the pastor before we change the style of worship. Amen. I'm not trying to be rude or cocky, but I just want you to know. We will change the pastor before we change the style of worship. Because we're worshiping God. And I've got to be careful because I have a responsibility in that. And you've got to be careful because we all, all have a responsibility and accountability. But here he worshiped the Lord. He called in the minstrel. It got his mind on God. The Spirit of God started to move there in verse 16. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. That's what it says here. Make this valley full of ditches. There's in a place where there was no water. In his, and the suggestion, and excuse me, the answer to the problem was there's no water, but dig some ditches for water. There's no water, there's no resource, but go ahead and dig your ditches. Noah, there's no rain, but go ahead and build your ark. 
And that's the principle that we're trying to uh, acknowledge here tonight as we think about it, as we get in here in 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 16. Make the valley full of ditches. There's no rain, there's no water, there's no promise of water, but before God can work, go ahead and dig the ditch. And you can't dig it big enough to outdig God's ability to fill it. Amen. We cannot dig the ditch big enough to outdig God's ability to fill the ditch. Thank God for that. That's a simple but wonderful truth. I want you to look here with me what I have on this handout. Some of you may have gotten one with the answers on it already tonight. If you are to feel guilty if you still have that, but uh, that was my fault. They went out that way this evening. But look here. These are things are familiar to us. Number one, as we, he says, make this valley full of ditches. What a privilege it is to be laborers together with God. Amen. The word in the blank there is together. We are laborers together with God. You know, we don't deserve God's salvation. We do not, we're not worthy to be a part of his family. But then it's amazing to think that he would look at me and look at you and say, make the valley full of ditches. You go preach. You go sing. You go serve. You go witness. You go teach the Sunday school class. You go teach the discipleship study. You go run the sound in the church. You go clean the toilets in the church building. Whatever, that we would have the opportunity to serve God and do anything for him is beyond our comprehension. What a blessing it is to be laborers together with God. We're to make the valley full of ditches so God can work, but it's not our work, it's his. We're just preparing for God to move. You know, I, I love people who think ahead. I'm trying to be one of those people. I'm trying to be one of those people. In a position like I have, I ought to be thinking ahead. If you have a family, you have to be thinking ahead. If you ever want to retire, you better be thinking ahead a little bit. If you ever want to take a vacation to a, spe a special spot with your family, they cost more than a couple bucks. You better be planning ahead, thinking ahead. In God's work, we ought to be looking ahead and planning ahead. Not for what we want to do, but for what God could do through us and what God could accomplish. What a blessing it is to be laborers together with God. Now look here, 1A, he does not always tell us to sit still and wait for the miracles. What I'm saying, God is sovereign. He does not need us, but that's why it's such a privilege for him to use us. He does not need us. We've been out in the streets of Newport News for the past three days, two and a half, three days, doing as much as we can, sweating for Jesus out there, uh, getting out these door hangers, trying to get someone to listen to us about the Lord, talk about the Lord, and people have listened, people have been saved. Thank the Lord for that report. Uh, but we're out there just doing what we can, doing what we can to see what God will do. God doesn't need us. He could have written that message in the skies of Newport News. He could have made sure that the people in the 23608 zip code saw it for sure where we've been there the last few days. But he said, you know what? I'm going to use my, my people to get this message out. And he doesn't always tell us to sit still. We're and not just on top of that. We're, we're not just looking. Thank God. We, it's a wonderful thing for people to trust God and be saved by faith. But we're looking beyond that to say, I'm not just looking for a person to be saved. I'm looking for a body of believers to grow out of this effort and a church to be planted. That's a visionary thing that really only God can do if it's to be done rightly and correctly. But he doesn't always tell us to sit still. Now he does. We'll look at that in just a moment. Often we are given, let her be, the responsibility of working while waiting for the miracle. I have a, I have a very, maybe it's my favorite passage in the Bible in Psalm 37. In verse 7 tells us to rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. I'm glad there's a rest in the Lord, that we can find rest in him. But rest is not what we, we like to think, lay down and going to sleep. It's just working while we're waiting. In Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us that we can find rest in our labors. It, 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 that's the cure to what people would call spiritual burnout, right? Be not weary and well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Uh, we, really don't, we, can just, we can still rest in the labor. Don't quit on God even when you get weary, the Bible says. Rest in the labor. There's a rest we find in it. We don't need to explain that some more some other day. But often we're given the responsibility of working while we're waiting for a miracle. And that's what we're doing. We're out, we're out working and waiting to see what God will do. We've made plans. We've rented buildings. We're trying to get things done. Are we trying to get ahead of God? Please, God, help us never to do that. What we're doing is digging some ditches that God will fill, hopefully, over there in Newport News. That's what we're praying for. 
Look here, secondly, they had to dig ditches for the water to fill. If they Look here, this is simple, but I just love the truth of it. 2A, if they dug no trenches or no ditches, they would get how much water? No water. I mean, the rain might come, but they would just, it would just rush right by them. That hard ground would just rush right by them. No ditches, no water. Now, the wa water is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But here, no ditches, no water. Letter B, few trenches or ditches, little water. Little water is better than no water. A little water is a few, few trenches, few ditches, a little bit of water. But if they dug many, let her see, many trenches, they would have much water. I think much is better than little. Little is better than none, but I'd rather have the much. More ditches, more water. More ditches, more water. And that's it. They, 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 they dug those trenches there for that to take place. And God wants us to labor with them. There's a picture there, John chapter 5. Will you go there with me for a moment? Trying to see if Micah's there yet. He's there. I got there first, buddy. I just want you to know that. We have a little friendly competition on the Wednesday night Bible study. How many of you consider yourself adept at the art of Bible sword drill, getting to a passage quickly? Micah does. And there's, no hum there's no humility in that hand I see right there. That's all right. <laughs> That's probably because I've challenged him so many times. But anyway, John chapter 5. Verse 5, a miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and a certain man was there. Uh, they're there by the pool of Bethesda. A certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? What an interesting question. Of course. <laughs> of course. I'm, I'm right here waiting, to, waiting for something to happen. That would be my answer. Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And you remember the pool there, the first, when the waters were stirred, the first into the pool would receive the healing. And he, he just could not get there. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. There's something missing there between verse 8 and 9 in a sense. It's not really missing, but... The implication is that he believed what Jesus said and he got up. He did something. Jesus didn't say, he didn't say, you're, he didn't snap his finger, say, you're whole, you're whole. And he said, he said this, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day, if the man had not stood up, he would not have been made well. It's a simple truth. But he did what Jesus told him to do. He did something he could not do, something no one else expected him to do. Didn't think he had the capability to do. And he did not have that ability without God. He simply obeyed the Lord. He got up. He did what he was told. And he did something he'd never done in his life. He walked. Something you and I take for granted. But what a, what a gift was given to him. Something he never thought could happen. And how awful he felt every day as those waters, were, those waters were stirred and he never got there. Exodus chapter 14 is the other side of the coin. You know this passage pretty well. I'm there, Micah. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. The children of Israel there are backed up and they need God's help. The... the uh, the Egyptians are bearing down on them. The Red Sea and all this taking place. And in verse 13 of Exodus 14, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show to you this day, to you, to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, shall you see them no, again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. I think what I learned from looking at both, both of those passages is you and I better be careful to never put our God in any box and limit how he wants to work. There are times when he may say, stand still, and we ought to be listening to the Lord. But I, I have to say in my own heart, I get pretty excited when he says, go ahead and dig some ditches. I love that. I love that idea that we can, we can move ahead and God will come behind because he's commissioned us and do the work. 
He'll allow faith to be displayed and things, miraculous things to be accomplished. There are times when the Lord directs us to do nothing. We ought to obey the Lord then. But here in this passage in 2 Kings chapter 3, he said, you need to do something. You need to, there's no water and all these people are struggling, going to struggle very soon in these armies. You're in a place where you have no recourse. You need water. We're praying for water. Why doesn't he just send the water? Look, before he sends the water, dig the ditches, make the valley full of ditches. And look here, number five, victory would be theirs if they were obedient to their human responsibilities. You know, God is not uh, simply a 911 call, is he? He's certainly not a spare tire. We were speaking of that recently. And, and so we ought, we ought to be obedient to God in a regular way is what I'm trying to say. Consistent, regular obedience to God over our life will produce the most amazing results. Someone's asked, asked me, many people have asked me many times about this church and about my dad's life and ministry. And I've said it to you. I think I've said it to others. When I think of it, I think I recorded this on a video. I think the story of my mom and dad was not a lifetime of huge, what people call huge zenith moments where impossible things were accomplished. I said where the whole world was in, was in awe, was awestruck. But it was a life of consistent accomplishment yielded to the Lord obedience. And we look back and say, wow, how did that all happen? How did all that happen? How did the church get planted? How did, how did people get called to the ministry and people sent into the ministry and, and people, families uh, rescued and lives put back together and people going on for God generation after generation after generation because somebody, and it's to God's glory, but people consistently obeyed the Lord without a lot of fanfare, a lot, a lot of accolades, without a lot of recognition. Man, we were so we were so isolated here in Smithfield at Calvary Baptist Church. When I told my dad I was 32 years old, you know the story. I said, I, God wants to be a, be a preacher. He told me I'd go, to hall, go down the hall in those doors and tell mother that. I can remember us standing out in the parking lot uh, by that old white van. Thank the Lord we don't have it anymore. But that old white van, uh, that old white van was out there, and he was and I were standing about it back, back in 2003. And he said to me, he said, you need to strike while the iron is hot. I said, what, what are you talking about? I don't need to go anywhere. I need to, I need to stay here. I need to stay here and, and just stay here and help you. I had other preachers telling me to stay here and help your daddy. And it sounded really good to me. It sounded really good to me. But dad said, you need to strike while the iron is hot. You need to, you need to launch out for the Lord. He goes, we are so isolated here. I didn't know who anybody was. He says, there's a place you need to go to school. I said, I, I don't know. What are you talking about? It's in Powell, Tennessee, Crown College. They'll probably let you in a seminary there because you already have a bachelor's degree. I was like, he said, there's a pastor named parents, Pastor Clarence Sexton. I said, who is this? Who is this person? Well, among independent Baptist people, that, that would almost be a foolish thing to ask in some ways. But we were just had our head down. We were doing the work of the ministry here. I was doing what I was told to do. I didn't know who anybody was hardly outside of this county. We were just working, trying to get it done. No, what I'm trying to say, nobody was trying to get noticed. Nobody was trying to accomplish something for anybody else's gain. Again, no one's perfect. I don't want to make more out of my mom and dad in their death than they were in their life. They're yielded servants of God. I'm just trying to make the point that a consistent life of obedience, when you look back after your three score and 10 or by reason of strength, four score, you'll look back and people will say, wow, how did all that get done? I don't know, we just kept doing it every day. We just kept saying yes to the Lord every day. It says here, I'm saying that a victory would be theirs if these men were obedient. Here came another day in the life of these soldiers. They'd already been commanded to leave out and march down. These foolish kings took them into a place where there was no water. Thank God they still said yes. They dug some ditches and eventually they would be filled up. Obedience to the Lord, consistent obedience, will produce a life of amazing accomplishment. The only problem is this. You won't be here to have everybody brag on you about it. You'll be in heaven. You may not be here to have everybody slap you on the back and tell you how wonderful you are. You won't have anybody to help and just enlarge our ego about it. But thank God we can say yes to the Lord. Oh, consistent obedience. Look here. That's victory would be theirs if they were obedient, number five. Letter A there. This would demonstrate their dependence on God, by the way. They hadn't shown, in a sense, maybe in contextually, they had not shown a lot of dependence on God in the decision they made to march out here. Applicationally, I can see how in our own lives, well, we launch out when people doubt us. We launch out when it doesn't make sense to people. 
Uh, people have asked the question, not, not many rude people, or I'm sure maybe they wanted to be rude, but they say, why is that fellow starting a church in Newport News? Why is your church, I had, I had my shirt on today, it said Calvary Baptist Church. And people may wonder why, why some preacher from Smithfield is over at Newport News trying to help somebody else start a church. And all I know is we're just trying to, we're depending on God to do something that we believe he wants done. We're obeying God, we're digging some ditches. Digging some ditches. And look, this is the key. Verse number six here. Our faith, our faith is to be the valley full of ditches. I don't, I don't want you to live a dangerous life necessarily. I have a friend. He'll be here with us later this year. And he's, he's taking his wife and beautiful children into one of the most dangerous places on earth. And all of us who love him and know him said, don't do it. And every time we do, I, think we're, I feel like we might get in a fist fight if I push it too much further. Because he's that committed to it. He's very kind. But he's like, don't, don't, don't tell me. <laughs> don't, don't tell me. Greg, don't tell me not to go. Don't say that to me that way. God wants me to do it. God wants me to do it. I say, but you're, you've got a wife. You've got a beautiful girls. You just need to, you need to play it safe. Uh-uh. No, his, his, his faith is a valley full of ditches. I'll introduce you, him to you later this year. God willing, we'll be able to help him. Look here, letter 6a, God alone can send the water. Yeah, we're digging ditches, but we have no access to water. We can't, we can't get the water. Only God can send the water. But we must let her be prepare the receptacles which he alone can fill. Prepare, let her be prepared. All right, we're preparing for something in Newport News that, that other people can't see. And now we believe that God wants. And let her see, if you dig the pits, the water of the word will be retained, retained. In your heart. The water of God will be, what I'm saying is the, the rain will come and we will be able to have a reservoir to draw from, to be nourished. We'll be able to have a reservoir as a resource uh, to, to help ourselves serve God and be able to get God's work done. I don't know about you, I'm excited about making the valley full of ditches. The challenge for us for the rest of our life and ministry in this church is to keep our shovels ready. And to keep digging ditches for the Lord. I've already told you, I'm, I'm, and I talk to these men about it all the time. I'm thinking already, where will we plant another church? And who will God send to start that church? Who will be the pastor and where will be the place? I'm ready to get back to praying that prayer. I'm ready to get back to praying that prayer. Because I just want to make the valley full of ditches. May God give us faith that you need that in your home, need that in your family. Uh, we need it in our personal lives, and by all means, we need it in this church. Amen? Amen? Let's ask God sincerely to give us that spirit here. I don't ever get to the place where we play it too safe. I don't ever want to be foolish. Uh, I don't want to hoard up money here. I don't want to save it for a rainy day. I want to be wise. We have contingencies in our funds. But I, I want to, to, to be able to let God even have that. Yeah, it's all his. We have contingencies, and we're trying to be wise when it comes to certain things, but I just want to be able to risk it all for the Lord and to see only what God could do. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd keep this in our